El libro ¿Por qué fracasan los países? El origen del poder, la prosperidad y la pobreza es el resultado de una década de investigaciones y análisis histórico de los economistas Darren Acemoglu y James Robinson. Un análisis exhaustivo con abundante evidencia empírica sobre el papel determinante que juegan las instituciones políticas y económicas en el desarrollo de los países, que según muchos influyentes pensadores está provocando un antes y después en el debate mundial sobre el desarrollo. Esta semana el doctor Robinson, profesor de la Universidad de Chicago, brindó una conferencia en Managua durante el primer encuentro empresarial organizado por Funides y la Universidad Americana UAM. Y ahora se encuentra con nosotros para ahondar en su tesis sobre por qué fracasan los países. Buenas noches, profesor Robinson. Un honor tenerlo con nosotros. Gracias. Su libro ofrece una visión histórica sobre el papel decisivo que juegan las instituciones en la prosperidad de las naciones y hace una distinción entre instituciones extractivas e inclusivas. ¿Cuál es la diferencia? Well, inclusive institutions are institutions that create incentives and opportunities for people in society to do all the things that economists know make a country prosperous, to invest in capital, in education, innovation, adopting technology, starting businesses. Economists know what makes a society economically successful, but the difficult thing is just creating structures, institutions, rules, which incentivize and give opportunities to people to kind of do all of those things. So inclusive institutions are institutions that create those incentives and opportunities, and extractive institutions are institutions that block, that don't create incentives and don't create opportunities. For example? Well, monopolies. In the first chapter, we start off by talking about monopolies. Many Latin American countries, you have many sectors which are monopolized. So if you have a monopoly, that doesn't create any opportunities. Nobody can enter, new businesses can't enter, somebody makes enormous amounts of profits. It's not a context in which, which stimulates entry, which stimulates opportunities, incentives more broadly in society. Usted dedica un capítulo entero de su libro para explicar la forma en que los dos hombres más ricos del mundo se hicieron millonarios, el mexicano Carlos Slim y el norteamericano Bill Gates. ¿Por qué es esto relevante? But I think that comparison between how those men made their money, it tells you everything about why North America is much, economic, much more economically successful than Latin America. Bill Gates made his money through innovation. He brought thousands of people into the software industry. Uh, Carlos Slim made his money with monopolies in Telmex and elsewhere. And according to the OECD, that reduced national income in Mexico. So it's not just a matter of Carlos Slim taking money from Mexicans. It's a matter of he, he does that, but he also reduces income for everybody. Bill Gates increased income for everybody. But I, what's powerful about that example is that this is not a difference between like good guys and bad guys or different cultures or Bill Gates wanted to be a monopolist too. Everybody wants to be a monopolist. It's just in the United States, there's law, there's the rule of law, there's antitrust, there's the government stopping you establishing monopolies. So, so, so it illustrates many things about our theory, about economic institutions, incentives, innovation, the fact that these cultural differences are not what's significant. But the fact that behind all of these economics is politics, is the state, is the state enforcing the rule of law and the level playing field for business people. ¿Cómo se forman las instituciones inclusivas? ¿Son una herencia de la historia o una construcción de la política? Well, I think, I, you know, I think it's both. I mean, I think that, you know, if you wanted to think about why Latin America was different from North America, that is a product of history, of diverging history and of, you know, what we, you know, what I would say called sort of path dependent institutional dynamics. But today, when you think about, you know, what keeps these extractive institutions in place in large, in lots of parts of Latin America, or what keeps inclusive institutions in place in North America, that is the politics. It's a politics that kind of sustains and helps these different sorts of institutions to reproduce themselves. Ahora, ¿cómo se hace el puente o la conexión entre las instituciones inclusivas y las instituciones económicas que favorecen la prosperidad? Es una tarea de los gobiernos, de la clase política, de las élites empresariales. I think it's a, I think I think everybody you know I think everybody you know that 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 in any society you know uh, I mean we emphasize a lot in the book that the problem in creating a more inclusive society is that 
some people have a lot of interests in extractive institutions. You know, that's how, you know, Carlos Slim has huge personal interest, economic interest in extractive institutions. So, so, so that is, you know, to create a more inclusive society, you have to change the way things work. You have to change institutions. You have to replace extractive institutions with inclusive institutions. And yes, that's a political problem, but you know, politics isn't just about what politicians do. It's about what everyone does, about citizens. Citizens have a voice, they have an interest. Citizens will organize, they can campaign, they can, you know, I tend to think that, you know, politicians, you know, politicians tend to do what citizens want them to do because they like to exercise power and they like to stay in office. So I think it's everybody's responsibility to try to change the way things work. And everybody has a collective interest in, at some level, in making things work. Although, you know, some people, as I say, benefit from the status quo, and that's part of the problem. Pero ¿qué dice la evidencia empírica sobre los resultados de estos dos modelos, el extractivo y el inclusivo? También hay casos de sociedades con modelos autoritarios e instituciones extractivas en los cuales hay crecimiento económico. Yes, absolutely. So, so what we emphasize in the book is that, you know, the overwhelming empirical kind of scientific evidence shows that, you know, that there's a very close connection between inclusive economic institutions and prosperity. So, for example, uh, some of the work we did, we showed that, you know, there's a, this is enormous strong connection between security of property rights and economic development, well-defined property rights, secure property rights. But nevertheless, you can have what we, we call extractive growth in the book, transitory periods of economic growth based on different sorts of institutions, based on deals, based on some coalition of interests, based on, you know, so, so this happened in many times in history, but it's never been uh, sustained. So it doesn't, it's not a path to a sustainable prosperity. That's what we emphasize. If you want that, then you have to move the society in a more inclusive direction, institutions in a more inclusive direction. Ahora, la sostenibilidad o la falta de sostenibilidad de estos modelos de crecimiento está vinculada a factores económicos o más bien a factores de tipo político. I think both. You know, if you think, you know, just think of some examples of unsustainable extractive growth in Latin American history. Mexico, you know, before the Civil War. You know, when Porfirio Díaz was running Mexico, there was economic growth. You know, there was exports went up, there was diversification, he built railroads, he even did some institutional reforms in the legal sphere, corporate law, you know, it, he abolished remnants of colonial institutions. So, so there was some reform, there was some economic growth, but that went along with enormous political uh, exclusion. It went along with uh, massive increases in, in inequality of expropriation of indigenous people, of a miserization. You know, if you look at army recruits, they got shorter over that period. So, so, so this created enormous political inequality, enormous economic inequality, and it created these, all of these grievances that exploded in the Mexican Revolution. You know, Argentina before the First World War is another wonderful experience of unsustainable growth, you know, without the right kind of institutional basis to create sustain prosperity and, 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 you know, and, 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 and not just, but, you know, but st and stability, social stability, political uh, stability. You know, even growth under Somoza wasn't so bad in this country before the 19, before the revolution, but that was economic growth, you know, of a very extractive sort that created all sorts of problems in society and, and was just very unsustainable. Bueno, en la Nicaragua actual, por ejemplo, tenemos un régimen político autoritario que mantiene una alianza con la élites económicas, hay una relación funcional que genera una suerte de estabilidad económica dentro del autoritarismo. ¿Se puede establecer acaso una especie de trueque entre crecimiento económico y democracia? I, no, I don't think, I don't think there is. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure how to characterize what happens in Nicaragua today. I would say, you know, if I, if I looked at the history of Latin America, you know, over the past 30 or 40 years, the first thing to observe is it's very hard to kind of dismount from authoritarianism. You know, you look at Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Brazil, you know, Nicaragua, you know, the first thing that happens after you get a transition from a dictatorship is you get hyperinflation, you know, everywhere, all of those countries, they had, you know, suddenly the society becomes much more open, it becomes more democratic, it becomes, you know, more inclusive. Politically, there's all these pressures and the political institutions can't cope, can't cope with them. And all of those countries, they've struggled to create democracies. You know, there's been populism, there's been, you know, clientelism, there's been all sorts of problems. So I think it's a, it's a work in progress creating inclusive political institutions. And I would say 
the big picture in Latin America, you know, and even in Nicaragua, from my limited knowledge of the country, is that there has been a lot of progress compared to the past, like today. So, so you know much more about it than I do. So you know there's lots of imperfections and lack of transparency. And, and, but but I, you know, the big picture, it seems to me, is that there's a big movement towards more inclusive political institutions. You know, there's elections, maybe the quality of elections is a work in progress, you know, maybe there's a lack of political competition, and, but that takes time to build. You know, the question is now, how can you make democracy work better? How can you make it more competitive, higher quality? How can you make the state work better? How can you make political institutions in Nicaragua more inclusive? You know, and that's, that's in everyone's interests, I think. Pero se puede plantear un dilema para las élites económicas entre la estabilidad autoritaria y la necesidad de crear nuevas instituciones que generen alguna inestabilidad. Well, I, I, you know, has authoritarianism been very stable in Latin America? I mean, I, you know, I tend to think, you know, if you thought about the history of Latin America, you know, democracy has never really had a chance, you know, to prove itself. I mean, how, how, how much democracy was there ever in this country, you know, before the last 20 years? Like, practically never was there, you know, and I think that's true in most parts of Central America. You know, Costa Rica has had democratic stability since 1948. Uh, you know, uh, most countries, it seems to me, have done better under democracy than in dictatorship. It's true that, you know, in Eastern, Eastern Asia, you have these experiences of very successful stability development under much more authoritarian regimes. But I, to me, that has a lot to do with very specific characteristics of East Asian societies and the state and the relationship between the state and society. And Latin America is not like that. Africa is not like that either. And so that model is not a model for Latin Americans to, to learn from. And, 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 and you know, so I, I, you know, I think they're, in the, they're going in the right direction. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. ¿Cómo se puede romper el círculo vicioso de la discrecionalidad del Estado y la falta de reglas del juego cuando algunos grandes grupos económicos podrían estar aprovechando esta situación particular? Yeah, I mean, you know, the state in many Latin American countries is very weak. You know, it's, it's, it's very clientelistic. You know, contracts are not awarded in a, in a proper, open, transparent way. A lot of employment, you know, is politically motivated and the state gives favors and, you know, people think that, they're, you know, and, the, you know, so the, the state has to be de depoliticized. You know, you have to gradually try to reform these practices and reform the way the state works, reform the way the bureaucracy works and just, you know, try to create, you know, that's, so, so, so that's, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. But, you know, it seems to me there's a lot of pressures in that direction nowadays. You know, there's a lot of international pressure, there's a lot of international best practices. Cuando usted analiza la situación de América Latina, ¿cuáles son los países que tienen instituciones más inclusivas y que proyectan un mayor potencial hacia la prosperidad. ¿Qué podemos aprender de ellos? Yeah. Well, I think I think those those countries are obvious. You know, I think Chile is an obvious example of that. I think Costa Rica is an obvious example of that. They have much more inclusive institutions and they're much more economically successful, you know, uh, than other countries. So so, you know, in the book we talk a little bit about Brazil, about whether there's been a change in Brazil. Maybe we, we were quite optimistic in the book about Brazil, about the nature of the Workers' Party and this connection to sort of local you know, this local upsurge of accountability and participatory budgeting, but it's very difficult to read what's going on in Brazil now. Depending on who you talk to, it's, it's you know, this is a good sign because it's now middle class people are complaining about corruption, they're complaining about the lack of services. I think in Mexico in many ways, you know, the people are very pessimistic about Mexico now, but Mexico is also, you know, it's made a transition to a very competitive democracy. There's real political parties, and it has an immensely diversified economy, you know, So yes, they have problems in Mexico. You know, they have this system which the PRI set up, which is not well adapted to, to, to the political system they have now. You know, this relationship between the governors and the national state. And so, so, you know, things need to change, I think, in terms of political institutions. But I, you know, I would be very optimistic about Mexico, for example, oh, in, you know, if, I, if you ask me, you know, the next 20, 30 years, who's going to do well in Latin America? You're just looking at the economy, Mexican's economy to me looks much more diversified and much more strong and dynamic than anywhere else uh, does. In ¿Cómo evalúa la otra cara de la moneda, los países del llamado socialismo del siglo XXI liderados por Venezuela? Yeah, I, you know, I think this is, this, is a, this is a feature of Latin American history. You know, one of the things that Latin America inherited from the colonial period was this immense inequality. You know, there's enormous inequality. 
There's enormous inequity, you know, lack of social mobility and opportunities in Latin America. And I think that, that can create, you know, very dysfunctional politics. Socialism, you know, in Latin America doesn't really look like socialism in Western Europe. And, you know, it has very clientelistic, very authoritarian aspects to it. You know, I mean, one of the unfortunate things about these experiences, you know, often their motive, you know, who, why did President Chavez come to power in Venezuela, for example? Because there was enormous grievances. You know, it was a very oligarchic political system. It was not performing well. There was a lot of corruption and there was a lot of poverty and inequality. And I understand why people voted for him because they're desperate for change. They just, they're desperate. They want to hope that something different can happen. But, you know, it's this very authoritarian model. You know, there's this ab sort of abolition of checks and balances and, uh, you know, all of this sort of syndrome of moving towards more extractive political institutions, which, which undermines accountability. It undermines, you know, participation. And, and uh, so, so, so I, you know, I understand where it's coming from. I think it's, it's you know, it's part of the leg historical legacy in Latin America. Um, and, you know, I don't know, you know, this, this just, maybe it's just part of this, uh, part of this process of, you know, coming out of the, coming out of this historical legacy and outgrowing it and, and creating a different type of society. Usted ha hecho un argumento como historiador a favor de las instituciones inclusivas y resulta difícil pensar que alguien podría estar en desacuerdo. Hasta se corre el riesgo de que estar a favor de las instituciones sea algo políticamente correcto. ¿Cómo podemos distinguir la retórica de las acciones concretas para construir instituciones inclusivas? Yeah, so everybody wants to say they're, inclus they're inclusive and they're in favor of inclusion. Uh, you're right about that. You know, so even dictators and they say they're all in favor of it. You know, I, you know, but I, you know, I think the, I think it's fairly easy to see when the reality, uh, the fact when the reality is different. You know. Podría darme una lista de acciones que permita comprobar eso. Well, you know, if you just thought about economic institutions or, you know, you could think about political institutions, you know, you could just think about, you know, we emphasize a lot how power is distributed in society. So I think that's, that's, more, than, that's more than elections. Uh, but, you know, elections at least are easy to observe. You know, we know what should happen in election. There should be transparency. You know, there should be independent election uh, administration institutions that can evaluate without political control what happened in the election there should be openness there should be not political interference and you know and you know so for example you know in the last I was before I came here I was reading some of the stuff that the Carter Center wrote and obviously there's lots of challenges in the last election in Nicaragua from that point of view and there's lots of challenges in many Latin American countries in Ecuador in Colombia in Venezuela and so so you know I think that it, there are some areas of inclusive political institutions where there's very clear criteria. I think if you look at the state, you know, about how people are hired in the state, how contracts are awarded, you know, there's very well-defined best practices uh, about how to make contracting processes inclusive. And that, you know, that, that just, there's, you know, we can, you can see that and you can see what, what, what happens, you know. So, so here, do they announce who bid for government contracts or who won the contracts or what was the process? So that's a very simple question. And the answer is yes or no. I, so Volvamos al tema de la sostenibilidad de los regímenes extractivos. Algunos de los ejemplos que menciona en su libro describen largos periodos de crecimiento con instituciones no democráticas. ¿Cuánto tiempo pueden durar estos regímenes? Well, they can last a they can last a long time. You know, I would say, you know, thinking about the Latin American case, one of the things which has helped sustain extractive institutions is, you know, very dysfunctional interventions by the outside world, for example. You know, if you thought about the history of Nicaragua with Mr. Walker in the 19th century or the US, in, in, you know, the U.S. intervention in the 1920s, after all, where did Somoza come from? Wasn't he like a creation of the United States? Or where did Trujillo come from in the Republica Dominicana? You know, you know so, so, so U.S. foreign policy, you know, uh, left an enormous mess in lots of parts of the world, in, in Guatemala, that helped reproduce extractive institutions. So, so far I've been kind of blaming the citizens a lot in, in society, but I want to say often, you know, in the reproduction of extractive institutions, there's a very dysfunctional interaction with the rest of the world. You know, the thing is societies with extractive institutions are, they're not prosperous, you know, they're dependent, they're easy to control, you know, and, and, and that, you know, that played a very, uh, that there were very unfortunate, you know, periods in the Cold War and even earlier after the Monroe Doctrine that, you know, I helped keep Latin American countries extractive. I, you know, I guess in the book, we emphasize that there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of persistence. There can be a lot of persistence in extractive 
societies, it's not easy to change. So, si el camino hacia la prosperidad está de alguna manera vinculada a la construcción de instituciones políticas democráticas, ¿cuál es el papel de los ciudadanos o de los sectores que no tienen poder y oportunidades económicas? Yeah, I think that's that's crucial. You know, in the book, we avoid using the word democracy. We use this word pluralism. No one really gets like why. You know, people ask me all the time. Like Francis Fukuyama asked me, why don't you talk about democracy? You know, because because I think you can have the word. Why why is that word different? Well, pluralism is about like power. It's about the distribution of power. It's not you know. It's not just I show up and I vote once every five years. You know, in an election. But it's like there's society is organized. You know, there's many different loci of power in society. So, so I think, you know, it, you, know, it, you know, think about de Tocqueville's democracy in America, you know, he, the whole focus of that was on the society, civil society, the organization of society. And I think one of the problems, you know, I see in many Latin American countries is that, you know, when, when the state is weak, for example, the state is very bad at providing services or infrastructure or whatever, it, it leads to a very fragmented civil society, you know, people are very obsessed with parochial interests, their own interests. It's very hard for them to kind of see a collective interest, you know. So, 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 and, you know, that's, of course, that's, a, you know, if you're running the country, that's a nice thing because it's very easy to manage, you know, it's like, it, but it's very, it's in a very symbiotic relationship with clientelism. This, so, so, so I think, you know, organ, you know, organization is like, critical, like, you know, collective action, civil society. You know, I don't know much about civil society in Nicaragua, but that's, that's very crucial. You know, I think that, that, that sustained organization, you know, the discussion is very much about civil society, you know, about organized civil society. And, you know, I, that, that's, so I, you know, I think that's, that's very crucial for people to organize and organize collectively and try to define, you know, what Habermas called a public sphere, to, a, a public sphere where we can mm -hmm. identify the issues and problems in, in, in our society and debate them and discuss them. Gracias al Dr. Robinson, profesor de la Universidad de Chicago. Y si ustedes quieren continuar la conversación sobre este tema, el libro Por qué fracasan los países, está disponible en la librería de Hispamer y en la tienda de libros electrónicos de literato. <música>